Hello again, this is the Pentrest High School AP Physics 1 video series. This is video 3A. It's the introduction to Newton's laws. All right, now most of us have heard the uh, mythical Isaac Newton story. Um, involves an apple falling from the tree, hits him in the head, uh, and he miraculously discovers gravity. Uh, the real story is a little different. Um, but we'll get to that a little later on. Uh, Isaac Newton was a late Renaissance English uh, physician and mathematician and is widely regarded as one of the most important scientists in recorded history. Uh, we're going to investigate gravity a little later in the course, uh, although you might say that the law of universal gravitation uh, would be one of Newton's laws. It's not considered one of the laws of motion. Uh, Newton's laws of motion are far more general. Uh, universal gravitation is a very specific circumstance, um, but again, we'll get that. We'll get to uh, gravitation a little later on. Uh, we spent a good deal of time working with kinematics uh, in one and two dimensions. Where is it? Um, and what is it doing? How is it behaving? Uh, Newton's laws of motion are designed with um, are designed to determine why an object is behaving in a particular kinematics fashion. So if we describe kinematics as what, where, and when, uh, Newton's laws will describe the why. Now the laws of motion were uh, formulated uh, late in the 17th century. Uh, they were detailed in Newton's uh, work, uh, philosophy, Naturalis Principia Mathematica. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but I don't speak Latin. Um, the translation is the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Um, back in the 17th century, they called science natural philosophy. Um, probably the most significant scientific document in history uh, brings together principles of uh, hypothesizing, uh, observing, uh, and verifying using empirical data um, in a language uh, of relatively simple mathematics. Um, he did pioneer the calculus, but uh, in the in initial editions of the Principia, uh, mathematics was limited for the most part to geometry and algebra, which are accessible to most people. Now, the laws of motion are concerned primarily with uh, mass and the effect of forces on it. So before we look at the laws themselves, we need to investigate what a force actually is. <clears throat> Simply put, a force is a push or a pull in a particular direction. Now, uh, there's a lot of different types of forces. Um, we have contact forces, gravitational forces, tension and compression, electrostatic, magnetic, nuclear, friction forces. Uh, there are others. Uh, for the time being, we're not going to worry too much about what the types of forces are. Um, as far as the object is concerned and Newton's laws are concerned, all these different types of forces have the same effect. So the force is a vector quantity. We know already that vectors have magnitude and direction. Uh, the direction can be indicated uh, as we know mathematically. Um, in the mathematical axis system or as an elevation or depression angle. Um, the magnitude of the force could be described as how hard the push is or how big the push is or how big the pull is. Um, force magnitude is measured with the metric system unit of the Newton, obviously um, named after Isaac Newton. Uh, the abbreviation is capital N. Uh, the Newton is what we call a derived unit. Uh, this means that it's composed of other, more fundamental metric system units. Um, you probably would be more familiar with the English system unit of force, which is the pound. Uh, just for the sake of perspective, a pound of force is equal to about 4.45 newtons of force. Now, uh, in terms of the, the derived unit, you can see that a newton is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. So we're going to take a closer look at that. 
Uh, we haven't looked much at kilograms yet, but we're familiar with meters and seconds. Uh, so let's take a look at the kilogram. Uh, kilograms are associated with mass. Uh, they're frequently used interchangeably with pounds, but as we'll see, that's not a very good um, comparison because they measure different things. The mass is the measure <clears throat> of how much matter there is in an object. The base metric system unit is the gram. Uh, a kilogram is 1,000 grams. I'm sure you've done metric system conversions. Um, for the sake of perspective, a baseball has about 150 grams of mass. Um, I have about 70 kilograms of mass. Um, a little car like my wife's Mini Cooper might have a mass of about 1,100 kilograms. Now, if you take a look at the units, a newton again, a newton of force is equal to one kilogram times meters per second squared. Uh, you might notice that this is equivalent to mass times acceleration. And that might, that relationship might ring a bell. We'll see very shortly where it comes from. Now, what you're going to find is that each of the laws of motion is stated in a long and convoluted sentence that uh, a lot of people can recite mindlessly without really knowing what it means. Um, two of the three at least will come back to you very very easily. Uh, we will use these textbook type definitions but um, in each case we'll have a translation that'll make it a little easier to understand uh, and more importantly for uh, the purposes of application a mathematical statement that effectively translate it, translates the law into a useful equation that we can use. <clears throat> now first, we have Newton's first law of motion. Um, again, the textbook definition is one that you will have heard before. Uh, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion uh, until acted upon by an unbalanced external force. So again, most people can finish that one as soon as you say an object at rest, they can finish it. Um, the translation, very simply, is that if all the forces on an object are balanced, the object will not accelerate. This is a much more functional definition of the first law, which is also incidentally called the law of inertia. Balanced means that the forces effectively cancel each other out. So if we have some forces to the right, we have some other forces to the left that cancel them out. <clears throat> if we consider an apple that sits at rest on a table, um, the weight or the gravitational force of the apple pulls down on it, and the table pushes up. The table pushes up on the apple with a force that's equal to the weight of the apple. And these forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, so they cancel each other out. Therefore, the apple does not accelerate. Now we can look at this law in, um, <clears throat> in a couple different ways. On one hand we can say that if the forces are balanced then the object will not accelerate. That's the part about the object at rest stays at rest in the textbook definition. Um, we can also go the other way and say that if the object is not accelerating then the forces on it must cancel each other out. So depending on what information we have initially Will, depend, will determine how we use the first law. Now the mathematical statement sigma f equals zero, this is the mathematical translation of Newton's first law. The sigma, this is the Greek capital S, it means sum. Um, sigma f means we add up all the forces that are acting on the object Notice that this is a vector equation. So when we look at the sum, when we look at adding the forces, we mean vector addition. And we say that it's equal to zero, which means effectively that all the forces cancel each other out. When we add them up, there's nothing left over. Now, we move to a, a more general case, Newton's second law of motion. The textbook definition says an object accelerates at a rate that is directly proportional to the net force acting on the object and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. That's a little convoluted. Uh, an easier way 
the translation is that if the forces on an object are not balanced or unbalanced, the object will accelerate. Okay. Again, this is a much more functional definition. Unbalanced means that they don't cancel out. When they're added up, there is a non-zero net force. And that net force causes the object to accelerate. Once again, we can look at it two different ways. We could say that if we know that the forces are unbalanced, the object will accelerate. We can also say that if the object is accelerating, therefore, the forces are unbalanced and there must be a non-zero net force acting on the object. Our mathematical version, sigma f equals ma. Again, this might bring to mind kilograms times meters per second squared, which is where the units come from. And again, on your formula sheet, it appears this way. This red box means it'll be on your formula sheet. A equals sigma f over m. Same formula, just divide both sides by m. Um, again, this is a vector equation. So when we add up all the force vectors, we um, come up with a non-zero result. And the direction of the net force is the direction of the resulting acceleration. Again, that makes sense. If you add up all the forces, you have a net force to the right. That's the way the object will accelerate. Uh, again, sometimes, uh, sometimes we know the behavior of the object ahead of time, uh, which will then determine which of the laws applies if the object is accelerating. We use Newton's second law. Uh, if it's not accelerating, we use Newton's first law. If we don't know the behavior, uh, we would probably tend to use Newton's second law because it's more general. Uh, now we'll move to Newton's third law. Textbook definition says uh, every action force has an equal and opposite reaction force. So the translation, uh, that one's not too tough to get, but um, the translation, if, if object A pushes on object B, then object B pushes back on object A. Same force, opposite direction. Again, the only thing I don't like about the textbook definition is that... Um, it should specify that you must have two different objects in order to use Newton's third law. Okay, we're not going to use this law initially because we're going to be looking at one object at a time. Later on, we'll look at interactions um, between objects that uh, exert forces on each other. So our mathematical statement is uh, vector F12 equals negative F21. That probably needs um, a little bit of... Uh, explanation. The 1, 2 implies the force on object 1 due to object 2 and object 2 pushing on object 1. So we have one object pushing on the other and then the other object pushing back on the first one. Notice that the vectors are opposite in direction. All right. So if F1, 2 pushes to the right, F21 pushes back to the left. Now the uh, pairs of forces referenced by Newton's third law are often called action-reaction pairs. Um, you'll frequently be asked to identify action-reaction pairs. Um, select from a group of forces which ones form an, uh, an action-reaction pair. Uh, given an action force, what's the reaction force? Um, the key thing to remember about action-reaction pairs is that they must act on different objects. So if we go back to our apple, uh, the gravitational force acts down, and the table pushes back up on the apple with a force equal to the, the gravitational force. Uh, they are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, so your temptation is to call them an action-reaction pair, but they're not, because they both act on the apple. So if you think in terms of the apple pushing down on the table and the table pushing up on the apple, that's the action-reaction pair. Um, we'll talk, to, talk about the reaction to the gravitational force itself in a, in a little bit. Okay, so these are Newton's three laws of motion. Uh, perhaps the most fundamental, most important relationships we'll investigate this year. Uh, 
sigma f equals ma in particular. That's a big one. Uh, you can see that the link between Newton's laws and kinematics, which we've done already, uh, is the acceleration. <clears throat> the acceleration appears in Newton's second law and also in our kinematics study. Uh, so we have not at this point uh, left kinematics behind. Uh, it may be necessary at times to, to do kinematics and find out what the acceleration of an object is and then use that acceleration to figure out something about the forces acting on it. Uh, we may have to go the other way, um, do the force treatment first and then determine the acceleration and then use that acceleration in kinematics formulas. Uh, so again, that's the big link between Newton's laws and kinematics. Okay, so that will do it for our introduction to Newton's laws. Until next time, I'll see you again soon.